begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. Saint Jerome, pray for us. Saint Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'd like to say at the outset that um, I don't think there will be time for Q&A at the end of this talk because we want to be able to go to the Holy Mass. So um, if you could just make a note of your questions, then when we have the Q&A session later, we can deal with those questions. My topic this morning is evidence for a global flood and its importance for our times. We saw last night that the traditional teaching of the church on creation was summed up very beautifully by the Catechism of Trent. And we saw that the Catechism of Trent taught what had been taught from the beginning, that God created everything in six days for us in our first parents, St. Adam and St. Eve, and that the entire work of creation was supernatural, that when he had finished creating everything for our first parents, he stopped creating new kinds of creatures because he had created a perfectly beautiful, complete, and harmonious universe for us. And that is what St. Thomas Aquinas calls the first perfection of the universe. All the different kinds of creatures, each one perfect according to its nature, all existing together with man and for man at the beginning of the universe. And we saw that St. Charles Borromeo and the authors of the Roman Catechism refer the pastors to Exodus because in Exodus 20, Moses tells us that God wrote with the finger of God the Ten Commandments in the tablets of stone. And in the Third Commandment, he tells us to remember something, something that he does not do in any of the other commandments. He tells us to remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. And he says, we must work for six days. We must consecrate the seventh day to him because he created all things in six days and consecrated the seventh day from the beginning of the world. And so we saw that, of course, God could have created everything in 78 trillion years or in a second in any period of time that he wanted. He's God. He chose to create the world according to the rhythm that we must follow if we want to live a happy, healthy, holy life. That's what a good father does. He doesn't just tell his children, do this, do that, do the other thing. He does it first. And this is what God did out of love for us. He created the world in the very rhythm according to the pattern that we must follow if we want to live a happy, healthy, holy life. We saw then that Satan has always hated this fundamental doctrine because he knows that anybody who holds fast to this doctrine will have an unshakable foundation for their faith and for their spiritual life. And so Satan has always wanted to destroy our faith in this fundamental doctrine. And God inspired St. Peter, our first pope, to warn us almost 2,000 years ago against the revolution that would come against this fundamental doctrine. And it's one of the most amazing prophetic passages in the entire Bible. Second Peter chapter 3, St. Peter predicts that in the last days, far in the future, scoffers will come into the church mocking the word of God in Genesis. He doesn't say that explicitly, but it's implicit. And they're going to say, things have always been the same from the very beginning of the universe. And we can see, and we saw from the tradition of the church, that this is a lie from the pit of hell. Because things have not always been the same as they are now from the very beginning of the universe. 
we saw that according to the constant teaching of the church, the whole creation, every kind of creature, was supernaturally brought into existence at the beginning. And when God finished creating our first parents, that's when he stopped creating new kinds of creatures, and that's when the natural order, what the doctors call the order of providence, began. So it is not true at all that the same material processes that are going on now have been operating in the same way from the very beginning of the universe. And so St. Peter goes on to say that these scoffers will have to deliberately ignore the fact, not the pious belief, that it was actually the word of God that supernaturally created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain. And interestingly, he says that they will also have to ignore the fact that there was a supernatural divine judgment on the entire earth at the time of Noah's flood, which so transformed the face of the earth that we cannot even look at the earth as it is today and understand what it was like before the flood, much less what it was like when God was supernaturally creating all things in the beginning. And so when Rene Descartes and the Enlightenment philosophers proposed that it was more reasonable to explain the origins of man in the universe in terms of the same material processes that are going on now. This was the exact fulfillment of what St. Peter predicted in 2 Peter chapter 3. And let's remember, St. Peter ran a fishing business. He was not a philosopher. And yet he predicted the very premise that lies at the foundation of every system of evolutionary thought. And so we saw that Descartes' uniformitarian naturalistic philosophy put his writings on the index of forbidden books because every theologian worth his salt knew that this is nonsense. It's not reasonable to try to explain a supernatural creation in terms of natural processes. It would be like trying to explain the miracle at the wedding at Cana in terms of some kind of microbial activity that somehow caused the water to turn into wine. It's absurd. And yet, that false way of thinking that St. Peter predicted gradually over the next 200 years insinuated itself into the minds of so many intellectuals that by the end of the 19th century, that way of thinking had come to dominate the thinking of the intellectual elite of the entire Western world. And we saw that after Descartes and Spinoza and Immanuel Kant and the rest of the so-called Enlightenment philosophers had proposed this uniformitarian philosophy that things have always been the same from the beginning of the universe, therefore we can study nature and from that we can extrapolate all the way back to the past and figure everything out. We don't need any revelation from God. The next wave of the revolution against God's revelation in Genesis was the geological revolution where Charles Lyell in England James Hutton in Scotland, Buffon in France, and others of the same mentality embraced this false uniformitarian philosophy of Descartes and his ilk and decided that they would interpret the rocks all over the earth in terms of that false principle that the present is the key to the past. And we saw that this principle is not only false, it is the exact opposite of the truth. Because if we really want to understand how we reached the point that we have reached, there are three supernatural past realities that we have to take into account. Number one, the whole creation was supernatural in the beginning. That's in the past, it's over and done with. Number two, there was a divine judgment on the entire universe at the time of the original sin. The whole universe was made subject to a bondage to decay. That's the teaching of Romans 8, 
because of the original sin that took place on this earth. That's in the past. Number three, there was another divine judgment on the whole earth with Noah's flood. And that's in the past. So the reality is, if we want to understand and present, we need to understand the past. The past is the key to the present. But Satan and his minions duped some of the most intelligent people on earth into making something a principle for everything that they did that is not only false, but is the exact opposite of the truth. And so we saw that Lyle and Hutton and their disciples, having no facilities for doing real experimental research in the field of sedimentology as we have today, imagined that great bodies of water came over the land, sediments settled out of the rock, the sediment uh, out of the water, the sediment hardened into rock, the waters withdrew, and then this happened over and over again over long eons of time. And if this is how sedimentary rocks formed in the real world, and it's not, we know that from real experimental research, then of course, when we look at the big sedimentary rock formations all over the earth, like the Grand Canyon, we can be sure that that part of the top formed very recently compared to the part at the bottom, which must have formed eons ago. And if that were true, and it isn't, then of course, the fossils in the rocks seem to tell a story of life developing from the from the fish to the amphibian to the reptile to the mammal, the bird, and the human, and that's how we get Darwin. So Darwin's speculation in biology is completely based on Lyle and Hutton's speculation in geology, which is totally based on the false philosophy of Descartes, which we saw he got from the spirit of truth, alias some demon from hell. It's a house of cards, and it is not an accurate understanding of the past at all. So, what we're going to do this morning is to see that there is actually overwhelming evidence, scientific evidence, for the global flood in the time of Noah. And before we do that, we should first acknowledge that there are theological arguments for a global flood that are sufficient to establish the truth. Number one, our Lord Jesus Christ testified to the global extent of the flood. When he talks about his second coming, this is an event that will affect every single creature on earth when it happens. So what can he compare it to from the past, the global flood? Because Noah's flood affected every single creature on earth when it occurred. Number two, all the church fathers testified to the global extent of the flood. Now, someone may say, well, the father's interpretation is speaking about something in scripture that pertains to a doctrine of faith or morals. This is a scientific question. No, it was not, not for them. Because for them, the ark was a type of the church. And just as nobody was saved outside of the ark, so nobody is saved outside of the Catholic Church. So they did not regard Noah's flood as something that was just a scientific or natural science question. Number three, there are different words in Hebrew and in Greek for floods. But there is only one word that is ever used in Hebrew or Greek for Noah's flood. And in Greek, it's the word cataclysmos, which is where we get our word in English, cataclysm. It's totally unique. It is never used for any kind of flood other than the global flood. So for example, when our Lord tells the parable about the man who built his house on sand and the flood came and washed his house away, he doesn't say cataclysmos. He uses another word for a flood. But when he speaks about Noah's flood, he uses the word cataclysmos. And that is a unique event. Number four, why would God tell Noah and his family 
to spend a hundred years or so building an ark to escape a local flood. It makes absolutely no sense. Why would he tell God, why would God tell Noah to take all the different kinds of land animals on the ark? Again, it makes absolutely no sense. If it was just going to be a local flood, God could just have told Noah to take his family to the higher few valleys as he told Abraham to go and move far away from his original home. And animals are perfectly capable of moving away from the flood if, if it's just going to be a local flood. It's this kind of exegesis that makes our young people lose all respect for the Word of God and the tradition of the church because they're not stupid. They understand that it's completely absurd on the one hand to teach them that God told Noah to spend a hundred years building an ark and that he had to bring all the different kinds of animals on the ark when it's just going to be a local flood. And finally, a local flood would make God a liar. Because when God made the rainbow covenant promise to Noah, what did he say? He said he would never again judge the earth by water as he had done in Noah's flood. But if Noah's flood was a local flood, then God lied. Because there have been all kinds of catastrophic floods that have taken the lives of countless hundreds of thousands of people down through the centuries. Really, my brothers and sisters, I should be able to sit down and we should all be fully satisfied <laughs> that Noah's flood was a global flood. But we have all been indoctrinated into thinking that it's imprimatur to the Word of God as understood in the church from the beginning. So we'll see, it does, even though it's not necessary. And we're only going to look at six bodies of evidence, but they're very powerful. Number one, this isn't physical evidence, but it's something from outside of Scripture that is very powerful. That is, that there is eyewitness testimony to the global extent of the flood from all over the world. Number two, we find marine fossils on top of the Earth's highest mountains all over the world. Number three, the mere fact that we find billions of well-preserved remains of all kinds of plants and animals all over the Earth is a very powerful evidence for the global extent of the flood. Number four, we'll see that we find sedimentary layers that cover entire continents and extend to other continents. Number five, we'll see that between these layers there is little or no evidence of any kind of bioturbation or erosion. They're just laid down one on top of the other. And number six, we'll see that all over the earth there are oversized valleys, water gaps, and planation surfaces which are very difficult to explain except by the global flood. So beginning with the testimony of the peoples of the earth, wherever missionaries, explorers, people who visited indigenous people in different parts of the world, wherever they went, they almost always found that the indigenous people had a very clear memory that had been handed down from their ancestors of a global flood. And it's interesting that the closer the people were to the Tower of Babel, where the great dispersion of humanity took place, the more similar their memory of the flood was to the Mosaic account. And when you look at the details contained in these ancient accounts that we find among people groups all over the earth. They even, they contain all the basic elements that we find in the sacred history of Genesis. 
that the flood was a judgment upon mankind for sin, that one family was saved, that um, it, the waters covered the whole earth, even the highest mountains. And then many of these accounts even include significant details, like the fact that Noah released birds as the waters had receded. And it's very, very difficult to explain why all over the earth, virtually every people group had a memory of a global flood unless it actually occurred. Everywhere that mountain climbers go, even to the upper regions of the Himalayas and the Andes and the highest mountains in the world, they find the fossilized remains of creatures that lived in the ocean. Now, admittedly, evolutionists have their way of trying to explain this, but it's in terms of the global flood, because there was a tremendous amount of geological activity during the flood, and especially at the recessive stage of the flood, when the wa waters ran off, the continental land surfaces back into the ocean basins, there was a tremendous amount of uplift. And as the mountain ranges were uplifted, the marine organisms that had been buried there were lifted up to the heights. And that's the easiest, simplest, most straightforward explanation of what we see. That on the highest mountain ranges all over the earth, we find the fossils of creatures that lived in the ocean. This is a section of the Grand Canyon called the Red Wall Limestone. And there's this one seven foot thick layer in which there are literally billions of chambered nautiloids. And they're found fossilized with other creatures that lived in the ocean. Now this stretches for 180 miles and covers 10,500 square miles. What kind of local flood produces this kind of deposition? There's nothing that even comes close to it. Now fossilization itself and the fact that we find billions of well-preserved remains of all different kinds of plants and animals is itself a very striking proof of the global extent of the flood, because fossilization is a very rare occurrence. Even in an area like this, animals are dying all the time. You have squirrels dying, you have raccoons dying, you have birds dying. How many of them will be fossilized? Zero. Normally, in the normal course of events, every dead animal or plant will be broken down into its constituent chemicals and it'll be gone without a trace. The fact that we find billions and billions of well-preserved fossils of all kinds of plants and animals tells us that something very, very special happened in the past. And Many times it's really driven home because we see things like what you see in this slide, an ichthyosaur mom buried in the act of giving birth to one of her babies. Obviously, this did not take a long time. It was very rapid. Because in order to get fossilization, you have to have sediment immediately cover the remains of the plant or the animal, seal it off from the air and from scavengers, and that's what allows the preservation. Now dinosaurs are found in dinosaur graveyards in many different places on Earth. And it's very interesting, if you go up to Montana, where we ourselves excavated a triceratops, you talk to the ranchers up there, and they are, many of them, expert paleontologists. Because on a regular basis, they find the remains of land-dwelling dinosaurs mixed together with the remains of creatures that lived in the ocean, and the ocean is a thousand miles away. The global flood explains that very well, but it's very hard to explain it in terms of the standard 
evolutionary story. The other thing that's interesting about these dinosaur graveyards is the dinosaurs are usually found buried in a posture where they're trying to gasp for air as they're literally being buried in mud. And this, of course, is consistent with the flood. We also find, in many cases, the tracks of dinosaurs lower down in the sedimentary rocks, and then you find the actual remains higher up. Because it didn't take millions of years. It was very quick, and the dinosaurs were seeking the higher ground, and the sediments were coming in and preserved their tracks. Eventually, there was nowhere else to go, and they drowned. Now, of course, Noah had to take every kind of land-dwelling animal. The average size of a dinosaur is not T-Rex or Brachiosaurus. It was the size of a sheep or a cow. So if he, if he uh, took the T-Rexes and the Brachiosaurus-type dinosaurs, and he had to, he would have taken juveniles. But most of the different kinds of dinosaurs did not grow to enormous size. It was absolutely no problem for him to take them on the ark. And if you look in the scientific literature over the last 20 years, there are many publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals testifying to the fact that in dinosaur bones, in the remains of dinosaurs, scientists have found intact proteins intact strands of DNA which would break down into nothing after 5,000 years in ideal laboratory conditions. Substantial amounts of carbon-14, flex flexible blood cells, and soft tissue. This type of material does not survive for millions of years. It's really remarkable that it would even survive for 4,500 years, which is probably the approximate age of most of it, because most of this is taken from creatures that were buried in Noah's flood. But it is completely contradictory to the standard evolutionary time scale. Now, we can look, geologists are very interested in studying the sedimentary rocks, largely for the purposes of extracting valuable minerals. Um, and they've done uh, enough work to show that there are what they call mega sequences, six of them, that basic, basically extend over the whole Earth. So here's a sedimentary layer that covers most of North America, but you can pick it up in North Africa. So we're talking about sedimentary layers that extend over entire continents and beyond. The type of deposition that produced this is obviously nothing that we see in any kind of local flooding events. Here's the, there you see the same layer that can be picked up in North Africa. Here are the famous white cliffs of Dover. These are chalk beds and you can follow the same deposit from the south of England all the way across Europe to the Middle East. What kind of deposition did you have to have to see this kind of formation? It's, it's something way beyond any kind of local flooding deposition that we see today. If you go through the Midwest, you see in the road cuts coal seams. You can follow these coal seams all the way to the Atlantic coast. Then you can pick up the same coal seams in Europe and follow them all the way to Russia. Again, this is something on a scale far beyond anything that we've seen in the post-flood world. And when highly qualified scientists took coal from different deposits dated from 30 million years ago to 323 million years ago, and they sent them to a world-class laboratory that has an accelerated mass spectrometer that can count the number of carbon-14 and carbon-12 atoms in the sample. Every single coal sample had a substantial amount of carbon-14 in it.
And carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years, so after 50 to 100,000 years, there should not be one single atom of carbon-14 left in the coal. But the 30 million year old coal had virtually the same amount of carbon-14 as the allegedly 300 million year old coal, showing that these things were deposited, the material was deposited thousands of years ago, and obviously more or less the radiocarbon ages are virtually the same for all of the material. Now, You've also noticed, I'm sure, when you look at beautiful photographs of the Rocky Mountains or any of the big mountain ranges, you'll see where these mountains were uplifted and there's layer upon layer of sedimentary rock that is perfectly folded without any sign of cracking or deformation. Now, if these layers had been laid down over hundreds of millions of years, when the mountains were uplifted, you would see deformation. You don't see it. You see these beautiful uplifts where all the layers are perfectly in harmony with each other. And there's no evidence of erosion or deformation between the layers. This makes perfect sense within the flood framework. Because when those mountains were uplifted, all those sediments had just been recently laid down. So they were very malleable. And that's why you see those beautiful layers all uplifted at the same sharp angles, no signs of any kind of deformation or erosion between the layers. And of course, this is why, or at least it's the best and most straightforward to find what are called polystrate fossils all over the earth. Things like trees that are upright and they extend through multiple layers of sediment, which according to the standard geochronology would mean that the tree had to stand there for hundreds of thousands of years. Obviously, that is not possible. We know when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980 that the, uh, the mud flows stripped the trees off the sides of the mountains and buried them in Spirit Lake and they were buried upright. And then the sediments started to form around them. So God gave us a living laboratory where we could see exactly how polystrate fossils formed during the flood. And this is exactly how it happened. And it did not take hundreds of thousands or millions of years. In some places we find whales buried upright, going through many, many, many layers of sedimentary deposits. Obviously, the, the, the whale did not stand on its tail for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. It was carried by the sediment flows and very rapidly buried in the sedimentary deposits of Noah's flood. Because if there's one thing that real science has learned about how sedimentary rocks are actually formed in the real world, it's that Lyle and Hutton were wrong in thinking that sediments settled out of water. That is not normally what happens. Sediments are normally deposited by moving currents of water. And we now have facilities that Hutton and Lyle and their disciples couldn't have even dreamed of or didn't dream of where we can do real experimental research in the field of sedimentology. This is the sedimentology laboratory at Colorado State University. They have these huge, huge laboratories the size of, of a big gymnasium, and they have flumes where they can put in different kinds of sediments, control the flow of the water, and see how these sediments are deposited. And based on that empirical research, we know that in the real world, contrary to what Charles Lyell imagined, sediments are normally deposited by moving currents of water, and the sediments are departed laterally and vertically at the same time. So if you think about a flood event, as shown in this slide, 
The sediments that are being deposited in the lower corner of the slide are being deposited at exactly the same time as the sediments at the high end. But if this is over and done with and Charles Lyell takes a walk in the country a couple of thousand years later, he's going to imagine that the sediments at the bottom of the formation were deposited long before the ones at the top when they were actually deposited at exactly the same time. This is the Tonto group, which is a large section of the Grand Canyon. And I believe that according to the standard geochronology, this is said to have formed over something like 13 million years. Well, one of the scientists that has worked with the Kobe Center from the beginning with uh, another PhD geologist published in the leading geological journal of France uh, an article in which they did an analysis of the Tonto group of this section of the Grand Canyon in the light of actual sedimentological research and they proved that from the analysis of the sediments you could be certain that this entire formation was formed when an enormous body of water moved across the southwestern United States, depositing the sediments laterally and vertically at the same time. And the entire thing was deposited in a matter of weeks or days. It did not take millions of years. Wherever you go, you may have noticed that when you're driving through a valley and you look at the ridge, you'll see these notches that are cut in the ridges but there's no water going through them. Now, the easiest way to explain this phenomenon is the global flood. Because in the recessive stage of the flood, the waters were running off the, the continental land surfaces violently. And so, of course, those waters were seeking the quickest way to get the ocean basins. And so, in the initial stage of the recessive stage of the flood, they would cut these channels in many different places. But eventually, as we all know from playing at the beach when we were kids, the water will seek the most effective channels. And so it leaves some of the channels and concentrates its flow in a few places. That is why wherever you go in the Shenandoah Valley where I live, you can see these notches that are cut and there's no water flowing through them. They're a relic of the recessive stage of the flood. Now, the mainstream does have ways of trying to explain them, but none of them are as simple, straightforward, or logical as the flood explanations. And here's an example of a, of, of a water gap up in the uh, north of where we live. The other thing that you probably noticed is that all over the world, we have enormous valleys with little pencil rivers running through them. Now, this is a little bit difficult to explain in terms of standard geology, but it is very easy to explain within the flood framework. Because again, in the recessive stage of the flood, you had this massive amounts of water carved out these enormous valleys. But when the waters had all run into the ocean basins, what were you left with? You were left this, with this little relic of that massive amount of erosion makes perfect sense. And here's an interesting quote from a mainstream geologist, Dury, who concludes that streams all over the earth frequently had 20 to 60 times their present discharge. How do you explain that in terms of uniformitarianism? You can't. But when you invoke the flood, it's very easy to explain. Okay, the last body of physical evidence, planation surfaces. A planation surface is a surface where the erosive force of water has been so powerful that it levels off the surface regardless of what kind of material is there. So you can have very, very hard rock, and then next to it you could have soft rock, but it's a perfect plane. So no matter how hard the material is, it gets leveled off to exactly the same plane as softer material. And this is something you find 
all over the earth. Enormous planation surfaces. Two thirds of the African continent is a planation surface. How do you explain that in terms of slow and gradual localized processes? You can't. But the global flood explains it very well. So we've seen every major people group all over the earth had a memory of the global extent of the flood. We find marine fossils on top of the Earth's highest mountains all over the Earth. We find billions of well-preserved remains of all different kinds of plants and animals all over the Earth. And most of them, 95% of them, are creatures that lived in the ocean. Creatures that lived in the ocean. We find sediment layers that cover whole continents and extend, extend to multiple continents. We see no evidence of erosion or bioturbation between most of these layers. Everything points to rapid deposition. And we find oversized valleys, water gaps, and planation surfaces all over the Earth. Moreover, only a global flood can actually give a scientific explanation of the Ice Age, because only the global flood produced the unique conditions that led to the Ice Age. You had volcanic activity all around the Earth. The water heated up in the oceans. It created a tremendous amount of evaporation. And water was shot up into the atmosphere from enormous chambers inside the Earth. So you had these very warm oceans. The air was saturated with moisture. But then the particulate matter from the volcanoes partially blocked out the light of the sun. So as the temperature plummeted, all that moisture precipitated as snow and ice. And those are the unique conditions that could lead to a, an ice age. You will not get a slow ice age because the more the air cools, the less moisture it can hold. Only the flood explains the ice age. And if people believed in the flood, it would be an antidote to the climate alarmism that is taking over the world today. So according to uh, the scientists who know how to interpret the evidence correctly, there was one ice age. Of course, the ice would advance and retreat seasonally, but it was basically one ice age, and it lasted from approximately 500 to 700 years. Now, most of our children are told that Noah's Ark is something like a fairy tale. And yet, when naval engineers have studied the Ark using the data provided by Moses, with this team from South Korea concluded that the Ark was ideally designed for what it was meant to do, which was not to get from point A to point B, it was to survive the worst storm at sea that ever would be. And these engineers uh, published in the proceedings of the International Conference on Creation Research, these guys are all uh, naval engineers. This is what they do for a living. They said that the ark could have withstood waves 100 feet tall. That's how perfectly designed it was using the data, the dimensions that are given by Moses in the sacred history of Genesis. Moreover, if you look at population statistics, we have enough data for about 400 years to know that the average rate of population growth is about one half of 1% per year. Now, if you start with eight people from Noah's family 4,500 years ago, and you plug in this empirically derived rate of population growth, you get 6.5 billion people in 2000 AD, which is right on the money. It's exactly right. But if you take the evolutionists' data and you say, okay, well, let's just start with two people 500,000 years ago, you end up with a totally absurd number of humans after the amount of time that would elapse up until 2000 AD. So again, what we're told in the sacred history of Genesis makes perfect sense.
So, I need to wrap things up because I don't want to make us late for Holy Mass. Why is this so important? Well, number one, the global flood testifies to God's sovereignty over this world. Theistic evolution makes us think that God is very distant, very remote. He's not. He made everything for us. He's intimately involved with everything that happens here. And the flood testifies to the fact that when we cross a certain line, he will intervene. And that line is this. When the world becomes so corrupt that children no longer have a chance to grow to adulthood without being corrupted, that is when God draws the line and he's done with it. And, if, and we are rapidly approaching that point again, and he's told us very clearly, if that happens, then he will supernaturally judge the world again, but it won't be with water. Number two, the global flood testifies to man's dominion over the whole creation. Today we have church leaders, many, making it seem as if the environment is more important than human beings. This is completely backwards. The flood testifies to the fact that God made us, for better or for worse, the masters of the stewards of all creation. The plants and animals didn't do anything to deserve to be destroyed in Noah's flood. But because we had dominion over them, they suffered the effect of our sin. Number three, the ark is a type of the church, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is the Ark of the New Covenant. And just as Noah and his family were saved because they got on the Ark, today our Blessed Mother has told us very clearly she is the Ark of the New Covenant. And if we want to be preserved from what is happening and what will continue probably to get worse, then we need to be consecrated to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She is the Ark of our times. And number four, the true reality of the global flood is a warning to our generation. If you um, are familiar with Blessed Elena Aiello, she was uh, beatified by Pope Benedict XVI. She was a very holy foundress of a religious congregation dedicated to caring for orphans and the needy. And she was also a genuine mystic and the Blessed Mother told her around 1960 that the world was in a worse condition than at the time of the flood. Now to understand what that means, you have to go back to Genesis, where Moses tells us that before the flood, God saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that all the thought of their heart was bent upon evil at all times. And this is the only time she told us this. In Akita, Japan, the anniversary of the miracle of the sun, the year of Roe versus Wade, having wept 101 times, she told us, if we don't repent, the Heavenly Father will send a punishment worse than the flood, fire will fall from the sky. So what is the bottom line? There must be some false way of thinking that is entered into the very air that we breathe, so that even good people now are being led by that false way of thinking away from God and away from the truth. And I believe by the time the seminar is done, you will agree that evolutionism fits the bill. So, we have the promise that in the end, Our Lady's Immaculate Heart will triumph. But we must then live our consecration to Jesus through Mary to help bring down the graces for that triumph and for that era of peace when we'll see the social reign of Christ our King and the end of the anti-culture of death. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.